It looked fragile. Thin walls of aluminum alloy, paper-like insulation, and spindly legs balanced on gold foil. But the lunar module was no ordinary machine. It was a complete life support system, a self-contained world that kept two men alive where no life had ever existed. The lunar module didn't just land on the moon. It had to keep its crew breathing, warm, hydrated, and alive in a vacuum where sunlight boiled metal and shadows froze it solid. Inside that tiny cabin, smaller than the front half of a van, every system, from the air valves to the water tanks, was designed to keep life going in an impossible environment. This is the story of the hidden systems that made that miracle possible. The oxygen, water, and power that turned a thin-skinned spacecraft into a living, breathing habitat. The moon is an engineering nightmare. There's no air, no atmospheric pressure, no way to carry away heat by convection. The temperature swings are extreme, up to 250 degrees Fahrenheit in sunlight and minus 250 degrees in shadow. The lunar module had to survive both. Every mission to the moon began with the same challenge. Once the lunar module separated from the command module and descended toward the lunar surface, it became completely self-sufficient. No external power, no ventilation from the mothership, no backup except what it carried on board. It had to generate breathable air, control humidity, remove carbon dioxide, keep temperatures within limits, provide cooling for the astronauts' suits and for the electronics, and supply drinking water, all from a spacecraft that weighed only about 33,000 pounds when fully fueled. That task fell to one of the most advanced life support assemblies ever built, the Environmental Control Subsystem, or ECS. The ECS was the lunar module's lungs and heart combined. It regulated the cabin atmosphere, handled pressure control, cooling, and water management. Its engineers at Hamilton Standard and Grumman had to design something that could operate flawlessly in vacuum, without gravity, and with almost no redundancy, yet failure meant death within minutes. The ECS maintained a cabin pressure of 4.8 pounds per square inch using pure oxygen. The decision to use 100% oxygen wasn't arbitrary. A mixed gas system, like nitrogen and oxygen, would have required heavy compressors and tanks, far too massive for lunar flight. But using pure oxygen at a lower pressure gave the same partial pressure of O2 that humans experience at sea level on Earth while cutting weight dramatically. Two oxygen tanks in the descent stage stored about 48 pounds of oxygen, and two more in the ascent stage carried another 37 pounds. That oxygen did triple duty, breathing gas, pressurization for the water tanks, and feed for the astronauts' suits. Inside the cabin, air circulated through a suit circuit, a closed loop of hoses and valves that connected both astronauts' pressure suits to the LM systems. Even when they removed their helmets, the air continued circulating through the cabin, driven by small fans and controlled by regulators that could maintain the exact pressure needed to keep everything balanced. But oxygen alone wasn't enough. The crew exhaled carbon dioxide, and without a way to remove it, the cabin would become toxic within hours.
To remove carbon dioxide, the LM used lithium hydroxide canisters. Air was drawn through beds of lithium hydroxide pellets, which chemically absorbed CO2 and trapped moisture. Each LM carried two primary canisters in the cabin and two backups in the ascent stage, enough to support a three-day lunar stay. The chemical reaction was simple but life-saving. As the moist air passed through the canisters, the lithium hydroxide converted carbon dioxide into lithium carbonate and water, neutralizing the gas before it could reach dangerous levels. The same technology saved the crew of Apollo 13 when the command module system failed and the LM's canisters kept them alive for days. But under normal lunar conditions, the system worked so precisely that CO2 levels in the cabin stayed below 1% for the entire mission. Humidity was another challenge. Each astronaut's suit and the cabin itself produced moisture through exhalation and perspiration. Condensation could cause electrical shorts or fog the instruments. So the ECS included water separators and condensate traps, removing excess humidity and sending it to collection bags for disposal before repressurization. In the lunar module, water wasn't just for drinking. It was essential to cooling. The LM carried three separate water systems, descent stage tanks for cooling, ascent stage tanks for drinking and suit water, and glycol water loops for thermal control. Water circulated through sublimators, small devices that rejected heat directly into space. Each sublimator used a thin, porous plate through which water slowly evaporated into vacuum, carrying heat away with it. This process required no moving parts and was self-regulating. The hotter the LM got, the more water evaporated. The lunar module carried about 35 pounds of water in the ascent stage for crew use, drinking, food preparation, and cooling for the portable life support systems when they suited up for EVAs. The descent stage carried additional water strictly for thermal control. Drinking water was produced as a byproduct of the fuel cells in the command module, but the LM had no such system. Its water was loaded pre-flight and strictly rationed. Each astronaut was allowed roughly two pounds of water per day. That included both drinking and rehydrating freeze-dried meals. Wastewater was collected in bags and vented overboard. A plume of frozen ice crystals glittering outside the lunar module after every purge. The lunar module had no generator. Once separated from the command module, every amp of electricity came from its silver-zinc batteries. In the descent stage, two batteries supplied 28 volts DC and could deliver about 2300 watt-hours each. In the ascent stage, four smaller batteries provided another 2200 watt-hours total. Combined, they gave the LM enough power for about 40 hours of continuous operation, plus a tight margin for surface stays and contingencies. These were not rechargeable. Once the batteries were drained, the LM was dead. There was no way to recharge them on the moon. That meant every switch, every fan, every pump was part of a finely tuned power budget. Engineers at Grumman and NASA calculated power usage to the tenth of an amp hour. During Apollo 11, for example, the entire cabin lighting system used less electricity than a single 60-watt household bulb. 
the guidance computer, radar, communications, and ECS shared the same circuit, so one surge or short could cascade through the system. That's why astronauts had to manage loads manually, shutting down heaters, fans, or displays when not needed to conserve energy. When the LM's ascent engine finally fired to return to orbit, it did so using power drawn from batteries that had already been running continuously for days, a testament to careful design and tight margins. Thermal control was among the most difficult engineering problems in the lunar module's design. In vacuum, heat has nowhere to go except by radiation. That meant the LM could quickly overheat under the sun or freeze solid in shadow. The solution was a combination of multi-layer insulation, radiators, and sublimators. The exterior gold foil, often seen in photos, wasn't actually gold. It was a composite of mylar and kapton sheets, aluminized and coated to reflect solar radiation. Each layer was only a few thousandths of an inch thick, but stacked in up to 25 alternating layers, it formed a highly effective barrier against both heat and cold. Inside, a liquid cooling loop circulated a mixture of water and ethylene glycol through heat exchangers connected to the electronics and cabin air. When temperatures rose, excess heat was carried to the sublimators where it was expelled into space. Unlike a radiator on Earth, Sublimators worked by allowing water to freeze inside a porous metal plate. As the vacuum pulled the ice into vapor, it absorbed heat from the LM systems. This provided stable cooling with no moving parts, but only while water was available. That's why astronauts closely monitored water quantity indicators. If the sublimator ran dry, cabin temperature could rise dangerously fast. The lunar module cabin was pressurized to 4.8 psi, held by walls barely one-eighth of an inch thick. Its internal volume was about 160 cubic feet, smaller than the inside of a modern minivan. Yet within that space, engineers managed to pack not only flight controls and navigation systems, but also all the plumbing, oxygen lines, coolant loops, and wiring needed to sustain life. Cabin temperature was maintained between 65 and 75 degrees Fahrenheit, controlled automatically by thermostats. The humidity stayed around 50%, and the CO2 concentration remained low thanks to constant airflow. It was, in every way, a small, functioning ecosystem, one that could run for three full days on stored resources alone. Even the astronaut's urine collection system was plumbed into the spacecraft's pressure system. Waste was stored in vented containers and expelled periodically through a valve to vacuum. Every ounce of water, every pound of oxygen, and every watt of electricity had been budgeted months in advance. The lunar module was, as one Grumman engineer said, a spacecraft that lived on a nice edge between enough and not enough. Despite its apparent fragility, the lunar module was incredibly reliable. Critical systems like oxygen supply, pressure regulation, and cooling were all dual string, meaning that if one circuit failed, a backup could take over instantly. Two oxygen regulators, 
two fans, two suit compressors, and redundant valves provided continuous operation even during failures. The electrical system was cross-tied between ascent and descent stages, allowing power to be shared if necessary. But in reality, the best protection wasn't redundancy, it was simplicity. The LM had very few moving parts. No generators, no rotating pumps for the cooling loops, and minimal complexity wherever possible. In space, every moving part was a potential point of failure, so engineers relied on physics, pressure differentials, sublimation, and chemical reactions instead of mechanical devices. That philosophy made the LM resilient enough to operate perfectly during all six successful lunar landings. The lunar module was more than a spacecraft. It was a life form built by engineers, breathing oxygen, circulating fluids, maintaining temperature, and exhaling waste into space. Its systems were invisible, often overshadowed by the drama of descent and landing. But without them, no flag would have been planted, no footprints pressed into lunar dust. Inside that fragile hull, life existed where nature said it could not. And when the ascent engine fired to bring the crew home, the lunar module had already accomplished the most human of feats. It had kept its creators alive in the void. The lunar module was humanity's first home beyond Earth, a fragile, miraculous world sustained entirely by human ingenuity. It didn't just land on the moon. It proved we could build life itself where none should exist. <laughs>